A pod of dolphins swims in the bow wave of our boat as we travel away from the southwest tip of Cornwall towards the Isles of Scilly. These enchanting isles offer the travelling diver a truly unforgettable experience. With crystal clear waters, a fantastic array of wrecks, a plethora of marine life, an old world charm in abundance, the Scillies are a haven for many types of flora and fauna, both above and below water. A look below the clear protected waters will reveal a wealth of colour and wildlife. The Scilly Isles have arguably more shipwrecks per square mile than any other place on Earth. A glance at the charts for the area shows this small group of islands to be a real trap for shipping. The variety of wreck is also staggering. Everything from medieval wooden wrecks that have long since been reclaimed by the sea to the ill-fated supertanker, the Torrey Canyon, which eventually sank after colliding with Pollard's Rock in 1967. As every diver knows, exploring a shipwreck is more than just a chance to see some history. It's also a good opportunity to spot some reef species, like this sea fan. as well as this male cuckoo wrasse. You could also expect to find many species of soft coral and polyp. Our first dive is on the wrecks of the Plimpton and the Hattor. This site gives two wrecks for the price of one. The Plimpton, a 3,000-ton steamship, collided with the reef in thick fog in April 1909. Eleven years later, the 7,000-ton German steamer Hattor was being towed when she broke loose from her tugs and hit the same reef. These days, it is difficult to tell the wrecks apart, but with so much to see, they are a very popular dive. Here we see the anchor and anchor chain on the bow of the Plimpton. Recreational diving is becoming more and more popular in the UK, and the Sillies offer many opportunities for divers of all abilities. Our next dive is the Sita, a 3,000-ton cargo ship that ran aground on rocks on the 26th of March 1996. She was grounded for 12 days before finally breaking in two and sinking, becoming the Scilly Isle's most recent wreck. Despite being a young wreck, she is already a haven for wildlife and encrusted with anemones and hydroids. There is something for most divers on this wreck with depths ranging from 15 to 38 meters. She now lies on her port side, giving a diver the opportunity to explore both above and below decks. The stern is adorned with dead men's fingers and anemones, and at the deepest part of the dive you can see the variable pitch propeller and rudder. She is truly an impressive sight and with the waters filled with natural light, you can see many of the ship's features well preserved. We enter a stern storage room through a hatch and follow the ladder down into the structure.
Once inside, you can find many of the original features still intact, including pipework running along the floors, and this interesting storage cage. A thin layer of silt covers most surfaces inside the wreck and care should be taken to avoid disturbing it. The sitter's superstructure offers many holes that are tempting to explore. With the hatch that once covered this machine room lying on the seabed somewhere below, we can see pressure vessels and pipework that once used to supply the ship's living quarters with water and fuel. Although the hatches that used to lead to the engine room collapsed, we can still find some of the machinery that powered this huge ship, such as this generator. And pipes ending abruptly where they were torn from their mounting when the wreck sank. One of the reasons the sitter broke its back just 12 days after running aground is that the containers and hatch covers were not fully secured to the deck. Consequently, when she began to sink, she rolled and the living quarters and bridge fell some 10 metres away from the main superstructure and now lie on the seabed at 40 metres. When she sank, fishermen and divers went around the islands towing in loose containers, later to claim salvage on them. Computer mice, car tyres, tobacco, house doors, even women's summer shorts were contents of containers wrecked around St Mary's. There were even allegedly jet skis that some lucky Cornish fishermen had towed ashore as containers floated as far as mainland Cornwall. Now home only to Pollock and Bibb, the living quarters offer a series of swim-throughs and the experienced diver can enter through one of the open doors to explore the many rooms inside. The corridors are quite narrow, but inside you can find the galley, offices and sleeping quarters. Talking of sleeping, according to the authorities, the reason behind the wrecking of the cargo vessel was that the watchkeeping officer had fallen asleep and the watch alarm had been switched off. As you proceed to swim from the stern towards the bow, the superstructure becomes less and less recognisable. In fact, as you reach the base of the rock that was the cause of the ship's demise, all that remains is a tangle of metal. which is now the hunting ground of many large pollock. Following the debris trail through a gully in the rocks leads you to the bow section of the sita. Although not as immediately impressive as the stern of the ship, the bow is remarkably intact.
Here we can see the ship's bow thrusters, and after 10 years underwater, the anti-fouling paint is still apparently working well. Swimming under the bow leads to a boulder-lined tunnel where jewel anemones adorn the rock face. And dead men's fingers hang down from the roof. And occasionally you see a glimpse of light. Upon reaching the exit of the tunnel, we are once again reminded that this was once a ship. And a top-knot flatfish swims away, startled by the lights. The shallower bow section of the sitter is adorned by kelp and other algae. Once laden with wood, this is now a home for many wrasse species. Dead men's fingers snatch any sustenance that passes by, and the walls are covered in plumos and jewel anemones. A hatch leads down into what used to be a cargo bay. And here we find a leopard goby and a group of whelk eating a dead sea hare. Wrasse are one of the most widespread of all the UK fish species. This ballon wrasse was particularly curious about our camera. This curiosity was probably due to the fish snapping up small startled prey that were disturbed by divers as they finned around. At the shallowest part of the wreck, which signifies the end of this dive, you can see the impressive foremast still standing. When you see the rocky shoreline, it's not surprising that there are so many wrecks to be found here. The solitude offers protection for many rare species, such as the sunfish. Off St Agnes is the SS Italia. She is lying on the seabed at Wingletang Ledges and is perhaps one of the most spectacular of the inshore wrecks. You can still see the massive boilers which are bristling with life. Hydroid species cling to every surface. And amongst the debris, you can find beautiful sea fans. The pink sea fan is one of the UK's most spectacular soft coral. Yet despite protection, they continue to be threatened by bottom trawling for fish and scallops and by water pollution. Like many of the Salonian wrecks, fog was the cause of the Italia's demise in May 1917. Some salvage was carried out on her in the 1960s, but many major features are intact. Rass swim through the tangled remains, and in the crevices, wary edible crabs hide from divers. The SS Italia is a great place for the underwater photographer.
However, there is more to the Scillies than wrecks. The many reefs and walls provide some truly spectacular diving. The Atlantic swells and currents at these exposed sites ensure that the reefs and walls are a riot of spectacular coloured anemones. Wildlife is abundant, and if you're lucky, you can have a close encounter with one of the many seals that frequent this area. The diving here offers walls encrusted with jewel anemones. These anemones are very small, about one centimetre across, but grow in massive numbers. They are some of the most colourful anemones found in British waters. Jewel anemones are commonly green and pink, or orange and electric blue, although nearly all colour combinations appear to be possible. Anemones can reproduce by splitting themselves in half, called budding, and this process can occur innumerable times. The result can be huge areas of identically coloured anemones forming amazing living technicolour canvases. You will also find fan corals, Ross coral, dead men's fingers, plumose anemones, sponges and much more. Resting on a bed of soft coral and sponges, this dogfish is seemingly posing for our camera. These impressive plumose anemones are found on Gilston Rock. Attached to the rocky wall, you can see many types of sea urchin, sponge, starfish, and soft coral, as well as some rare anemone species. The vistas here are truly fantastic and it's well worth spending time exploring the rocky crevices. You never know what you might find, or what might find you. The plumose anemone occurs in large numbers in British waters, covering expanses of seabed or wrecks. In its fully active state, this anemone has a tall, smooth column topped with a crown of numerous fine, slender tentacles, which give the animal its characteristic feathery appearance. When contracted, the anemone appears as a little mound. Individuals may be white, orange, green or brown in colour, and this species has a strong preference for areas of strong water flow, hence its frequent position on rock pinnacles or prominent pieces of wreckage. It can also be found in shallow, shady spots such as overhangs and jetty pilings. Individuals can grow up to 30 centimetres tall. With wildlife in abundance, it's not surprising that you find the odd lobster hiding under the rocks. At the end of your dive, the shallows offer kelp gardens teeming with life. Pollock search for food. And in these clear waters you can expect to find many jellyfish species. Compass jellyfish is identified by a radial pattern of dark brown V-shaped markings on its umbrella or bell. A 
and snake blocks anemones use the kelp for support in the shallows. Turning now to the Cornish coast, we dive the wreck of the Carmarthen. This 4,000 ton steamer sank on the 26th of July, 1917, after being torpedoed by the German U-boat UC-50. Today, the wreck of the Carmarthen is a pleasant place to dive with much marine life around her in 20 meters of water. Most of the broken wreckage stands about three meters proud of the seabed, though her boilers are a good five meters from the sand and the shingle. The wreck offers many swim-throughs, and beneath her hull plates you can find tunnels bursting with life, like this feeding sea cucumber. It's a good place to practice your buoyancy skills and you'll be surprised what you can find underneath the hull plates, like this compass jellyfish. It's a relatively shallow and relaxed dive so you should have plenty of time to explore the wreckage. She has been well salvaged and her gun is gone but there is some ammunition for it buried under the sand if you fancy a rummage. This spiny starfish, almost a foot across, is on the wreck of the Hera. The Hera was a four-masted, 280-foot long steel bark that foundered in rough weather on the 30th of January, 1914. Her cargo was 30,000 pounds worth of nitrate from Chile, a very valuable cargo for the time. She now lies a few hundred meters north of Gull Rock, east of Nair Head, in 15 to 18 meters of water. The wreck is very broken. Rusted metal pieces lie jumbled, broken up by the many winter storms, leaving the visiting diver with no instantly visible means of telling whereabouts on the wreck you are. But here you will find several large wrasse and pollock patrolling their hunting ground. And under the hull plates, you can find shoals of young bib and whiting. If you fancy a squeeze, there are some very narrow spaces to try and explore. They're worth a look. You never know what you might find in there. However, these are tight spots and not recommended for the inexperienced diver.
HMS Scylla was built in Devonport dockyards in 1968 as a Leander-class frigate. After a life of 25 years in active service, she became, in 2004, a new diving reef. Owned by the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth, her newfound life assists the local economy and supports important marine research. The Scylla was made diver safe by the Royal Navy before decommissioning. And now you can explore almost every room in her cavernous interior. Much of the interior is still as intact as the day that she was sunk. Here you can see the Exocet missile launch control box. Within a year, Scylla has complemented James Egan Lane, another local dive attraction, and boasts an array of wildlife, including sea urchins, squirts, anemones, piped hydroids, whiting, dogfish, and many a diver. You can spend hours exploring this fascinating wreck. Although she's only been on the bottom for two years, she's already well silted up and good finning technique is essential to be able to explore this wreck to the full. With cavernous machine rooms as well as narrow corridors, the Scylla offers something to almost every diver. And although it may seem easy to get lost inside this large ship, there's almost always a clear view to the world outside. With filing cabinets and drawers still in place, you could almost think that the ship is still alive. And seeing air venting from a pipe, you might be right. If you find you've seen all you want to see in a certain area, just pop out of a hole and find another one to go in. are synonymous with UK wreck life, and on the Scylla, this is no exception. Many of the rooms towards the stern of the ship are home to young fish. This is the turbine room, where the two large gas turbines that used to generate the electricity to power the vessel are still in position. Here you can swim all around the large machinery and follow the pipes and walkways.
When exploring the aft of the ship, a visit under the stern is a must. Although both propellers have been removed, you can still see the prop shafts and their mountings. At the stern, you can enter one of the many companionways and corridors that run the entire length of the ship. You can find numerous shrimp hiding in the corners in the corridors. You can coax them out with your finger. On reaching the bow, you can see the anchor chains, although the anchors themselves are a long way off the bow in the seabed. These steel tubes were used for the pyrotechnic display when the Scylla was sunk. A quick swim back towards the bridge takes you past the gunning positions and missile racks which used to hold the exosets. Mullets swim around the kelp-covered bridge and back towards the funnels. The final pass of the bridge signifies the end of our dive and the end of this journey. <laughs>